behind the scenes with the scientists, how the government reacted. Lockdown one following the science at nine. Now on BBC Two, Politics Live. It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, Director of the Academy of Ideas and now Baroness, Claire Fox. Conservative peer, Ed Vasey. Political commentator, Steve Richards. And Shadow Home Office Minister, Sarah Jones. Today. I've decided that the era of cutting our defence budget must end, and it ends now. Boris Johnson goes on a £16 billion military spending spree. But can we afford it? I'm used to street life together and I'm used to like having people around and that before I never wanted a place. Never, now I can't wait to have a flat. Hotels turned into shelters for rough sleepers during the lockdown. But could homelessness increase when evictions restart? We'll ask TV presenter and homelessness campaigner Rob Rinder. Jeremy Corbyn's a Labour Party member again, but not a Labour MP. Unite boss Len McCluskey isn't happy. It looks to me very much like a witch hunt and persecution of, um, of a decent man. Well, you heard there in the headlines at the top of the show, Boris Johnson saying that he is going to spend on defence £16 billion over the next four years. But this, at the same time as we see in the Financial Times with this headline, that the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, faces worst hit to public finances since the Second World War. So the question for the panel to open the show is, can we afford it, Claire? We certainly can't afford it, but I don't want to discourage any spending on public good and lots of people would say that it's going to create lots of jobs brings us into a new era on cyber security and on space and quite exciting and forward looking but you know i get a bit nervous why this was prioritized you know there's something about the way boris johnson turns up with the army when he wants to assert authority and <laughs> um, it's kind of like trying to steal the fact that they're the kind of big guys and i'm not entirely sure it's the right when we're doing global Britain and the projection on the world, I'm just not sure that it's entirely military global Britain that we want to be emphasising on its own. Right. Well, military met metaphors are things that we've heard from Boris Johnson, Ed Vasey. Uh, I mean, can we afford it? Should we be spending that much on defence? Well, I, I think this is a great defence review. And I, I, you know, I think this question about whether we can afford it is a massive one, because from what I can see, we can't afford anything. <laughs> well, we've got to we're, we're practically bust. But well, if you, right. Well, then... If you take it in isolation, leaving aside the 16 billion price tag. And I think Claire makes a, a good point, but this is obviously part of the reset of Boris Johnson, because yesterday it was green jobs, today mm. it's defence jobs. What I really like about this is, first of all, it is forward-looking, cyber security and space and artificial intelligence and drones and so on. Secondly, actually, for once, you can say that defence spending actually could benefit the economy, because there's a whole cluster of kind of tech companies that will grow up around building safe and secure satellites or uh, investing in cyber security, which will have, actually have a massive knock-on into the domestic economy. But whether we can afford it, I have no idea. I mean, the country is so much in debt now that it's a, it's a tough one. But it, right. it, it, taken in isolation as a forward-looking defence review that's going to have massive knock-on benefits for the UK economy, it's a good thing. Is this spending you can support, Sarah? As we just said in Parliament, um, security has to be the number one priority. And we knew two things. We knew that there was a growing uh, modern threat and we were behind uh, on, on that and we need to catch up. And we knew that there was a massive black hole in defence spending since 2010, a £16 billion pound black hole. So, so we welcome the money. I think what's slightly peculiar is that there's no context there's no strategy that's been announced today. So the questions Keir just asked the Prime Minister in, in Parliament were, where is the money going to come from? What is the plan? What is the strategic plan in terms of that defence spending? How is it all going to work? Um, and are you actually going to try and raid the commitment to legal commitment to 
significant spending on international development, which at this moment of definition for our country is really important. It's, it's something we lead the world on. It's part of who we are and it's part of our defence as well as part of our um, engagement in modern uh, in the modern world. So I think we need to know whether the Prime Minister is going to, uh, is going to reach into that budget. Uh, Sarah, there's a little bit of a problem with your sound. We can hear you. Uh, we might try and work on that with you in just a moment. But, um, Steve, what is your take in terms of it being a priority? We've got the spending review. It is only going to be a year. Um, ironically, uh, this is a four-year settlement here uh, for defence. Presumably, it does mean that there will be departments who perhaps will have to struggle as a result or tax rises further down the line. Both. And this is the problem. I mean, the key word is priority. Um, I'm, you know, I don't believe we should be cutting back on public spending at this moment, although it's worrying, in my view, that this is the issue that's been given a sort of four-year spending uh, commitment. And it's very interesting. When Boris Johnson made his speech earlier this year, do you remember, I think he went to Coventry or somewhere and said, look, I am Rooseveltian. I am like Roosevelt. I believe in investing to level up and all, all that incidentally pre the so-called relaunch. Um, and I think at that point, he allocated vaguely £7 billion for what was meant to be a key part of the government's set of priorities. Now, this is £15 billion, uh, on defence without even quite working out where it's coming from or what it's going to be spent on. So there's a, a kind of a bit of a strategy of, you know, one day it's this, one day it's that. But you do have to prioritise. And it strikes me as odd that defence comes well above his Rooseveltian excursion earlier this year into levelling up territory. If you bring it up, uh, we can talk to the BBC's diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, about this issue that, yes, the money is there, but we're still not sure, that's right, isn't it, James, on what, what it will be spent on and how it's going to be allocated. <laughs> Well, I think uh, the Prime Minister is setting out some of the detail as we speak. Uh, clearly, a chunk of the money is going to be spent on paying off existing debts and black holes. A lot of it's going to be spent on some new technologies, cyber and space. But also the interesting thing the Prime Minister has just announced, there's obviously going to be a big push, too, on maritime capability. So there's going to be a lot more investment in frigates uh, and research vessels and projecting naval power around the world. That's the new element that we've just heard from the Prime Minister. Right. In terms of, though, the, the place of Britain in the world, or where Britain is going to be in sort of 10, 20 years' time. Is that what's missing from this? Yes, entirely. Uh, if you remember, when the Prime Minister announced this review of foreign defence and security policy back in February, he said this was going to be the biggest review of Britain's uh, place in the world since the end of the Cold War. Where does Britain want to be in 2030 and beyond? What's happened is that because of events that we've known, the defence element has been taken out of it, the money element has been decided now, and we're not going to get the rest of the review, the strategy, the ambitions, uh, until the new year. And so the, the, the risk here is that they're putting the cart before the horse, they're going for the means before fully working out the ends. Now, Number 10 insists that's not right. They say, look, no, we've worked out 90% of, the, uh, this, of this review and so this is just the first tranche of it. I think th there will be others who will be sceptical of that. Uh, James, thank you very much there from Central Lobby. Does that matter, Claire? Well, I just wanted to draw a contradiction out because, I, you know, a lot of people uh, just commenting informally this morning on social media, you know, oh, this will appeal to a type of voter that voted for the Tories because they kind of like defence and a lot of families in the army and so on. But, you know, we're about to talk about homelessness and if you look at the fate of ex-veterans, oh. they're often disproportionately homeless. Or even if you look at the way that they were treated on Remembrance Sunday when, because of this draconian law on you can't ha have services, they're all kicked, all the ex-vets were kicked out into the cold. I mean, in other words, ironically, if they're trying to appeal in some way to this is Britain great in the world, there and, and a military power, I just think that the treatment of soldiers might start at home. Well, and uh, that's a sorely neglected area, in my opinion. Has Claire got a point? No, I don't think she does, and it's a slightly surreal discussion. It's, I mean, it, uh, you oh. know, maybe I've been out of politics too We're long, experts at we, surreal we've discussion. We've got a fantastic veterans minister in Johnny Mercer who is uh, working incredibly hard on and it's an issue that he feels very passionate about. And because did, he we, says it hasn't really been dealt well, with. Exactly, and we did create a veterans minister. I think Tobias Elwood was the first veterans minister. So I think there is a resolute focus on that and co particularly coordinating the, the amazing work of many charities. The reason I say it's a surreal discussion and p partly addressing what James was also saying earlier, is that this seems to me exactly the forward-looking 
defence review that we need. I would be right. more radical and merge the three services, which is complete blasphemy to anyone who's served in the armed services. It's forward-looking. And as for Britain's place in the world, it seems fairly obvious that uh, this defence spending will cement our alliance with the United States and, frankly, through a Brexit prism, will give us, as it were, a seat at the table with the European Union uh, where we're going to have to forge a new relationship with them. All right. Plus, it will give us something to do in terms of the huge issue of China's growth in the Pacific. All right. Well, Claire mentioned homelessness. We are going to talk about it um, and talk to Rob Rinder uh, in a moment. He's the ambassador for the homelessness uh, charity Shelter. First of all, I just want to show everyone an excerpt from a film about the Everyone In programme that is running in England. It ran also during the lockdown and it actually successfully uh, got rough sleepers off the the streets with accommodation in unused hotel rooms and hostels. Let's have a look. Just like a hotel would be run, people will come in and drop their keys off. The rooms have their own beds um, and then wash facilities, a shower, basin, um, they have a TV. Homeless since the age of 12, Sarah has spent the last month here. She says it's given her the stability to stay off heroin and start to think about life long term. I'm used to street life together and I'm used to like having people around and that. Before I never wanted a place. Never, now I can't wait to have a flat. You know, it's like shocking things. It's you and myself saying what I want. So Rob, you're an ambassador. What is it you're focusing on in the charity? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for really shining a, a light on this issue. It's been fascinating to, to listen to the discussion this morning. Uh, and I'll answer your question, but before we do, uh, there was a question that was po posed to your panel. Um, mm. How are we placed, how are we considered uh, in the world? And I understand that our armed forces have to make sure that they're looked after, but Claire made a critical point, the disproportionate, to say the very least, number of ex-veterans who find themselves homeless, which is a scandal, an inarticulate scandal. Um, but the reality is that £12 billion would build over 100,000 homes and 50,000 social homes. Now, what we're looking for is this, to ask ourselves, what is our place in the world when we look out into our communities? And there will be tonight over 136,000 children. I emphasise that, children who are homeless, over a million still waiting for a home. And that's happened because of the COVID crisis. It's made infinitely worse. Those who felt that they were safe for a short period of time, over mm. 300,000 people, now are in rental crisis. Now, some work has been done, and as people will know, there is a moratorium. That means that there's now a six-month period before people can be evicted, and there'll be no evictions until January. But that's no good unless people have access to quality legal advice. Many of those people already weren't living in safe and decent accommodation. And the challenge is that there was no lawyer there to assist them. So the short-term ask is this. Firstly, there can be no access, there can be no justice, there's no rule of law of any meaningful sort unless all of us have access to justice. That means people need good quality legal advice. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, when the government promised that nobody would lose their home as a result of this crisis, they need to stand by that. That's absolutely essential. We need to be looking at ways of forgiving the debt that's accrued as a result of people being unable to work during this period. Yeah. Now, that doesn't just benefit the homeless. It also benefits landlords of where, as well, many of whom, understandably, don't own a lot of homes. Many people were lured into purchasing, as we know, buy-to-let right. mortgages, and they might have one home well, that they rent out that they use for their pension. Oh. That assists them as well. All right, Rob, let me get, because I need to get some reaction, because we, we need to unpack some of this. The first thing is this moratorium on evictions. That's over, I think, on January the 11th, um, as Rob was saying. What is going to happen then? What should happen then? Because there will be people with large debts who will not be able to pay. Well, I don't know what's going to happen, but we know that what happened with the furlough scheme, which is that Rishi Sunak was persuaded to extend it when we went into a second lockdown. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if there were live discussions going on between Number 10 and the Treasury about whether or not to uh, extend the moratorium on evictions. Because now, otherwise know, bailiffs are going to be coming we, around we, kicking these people out. We know what Rishi Sunak's approach is, which is he wants to abandon, and I don't say that in a pejorative way, but he wants to abandon as soon as possible a lot of the emergency measures that have been brought in uh, as uh, 
because of COVID. And we saw that he wanted to abandon the, the furlough scheme, but he recognised that the second lockdown meant he had to extend it. Now, we, uh, I hope that they will assess the situation. But at the same time, I suspect, which is tonight, will take quite a tough view as well, which is, as it were, the market has to come back in the sense when people start going back to work, people have to start paying rent and they can't necessarily expect that this is going to last forever. Right. Well, Rob, do you want to talk to Ed about that? Uh, well, um, I'm happy to take part in, in, in any discussion, uh, as I'm confident um, Shelter to is. Uh, uh, but the reality of the situation is that people are now in rental crisis. That's not going to be made up with uh, some magic formula. I understand, people understand that uh, benefit can't last forever. But there are millions of people who don't have access to benefit as it currently stands, and there's a cap on the benefit they can receive. Um, that needs to be resolved as well. You know, I'm no intellectual slouch, and I spent the time and trouble trying to fill in a universal credit form, trying to elbow my way in in order mm. to deal with the type of people that are required to get the benefits that most people are entitled to. And it's extremely difficult, to say the least. If that's me, most people who are entitled to housing benefit, who will be entitled to okay. housing benefit, simply won't have access to it. Ed? Well, I mean, as I say, I mean, I, 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 repeat, I repeat the point, which is that the emergency measures were brought in to support people during the pandemic. We know that Rishi Sunak's default position is to end the emergency measures as soon as possible. And we know that the pushback is you can't end them at this moment. They need to be extended. At some point, they will have to come to an end. And I take your point about universal credit. It, it is a truth that universally acknowledged that government forms are always fiendishly complicated. And the more we can make them simpler the better. I think the introduction of universal credit was a good thing because it was motivated by that desire to give people one door through which to get their benefits rather than a range of multiple and complicated benefits which easily, where people easily fell through the cracks. Should but the you'd agree Rob, that the go government on. must abide by its promise that those who found themselves in rental crisis as a result of COVID would not lose their home. That's a promise that people across the country relied on. Many in communities that voted for your party for the first time. That's a promise I'm confident that you would want your party to stand by. Well, I think you would also recognise that any government that breaks its promise normally gets uh, punished at the ballot box. And that will no doubt be a factor between the discussions between Number 10 and the Treasury, and indeed Robert Jenrick, no doubt, as well. Uh, right, well, that, of course, isn't for a few years, um, but I'm sure Conservative MPs in many areas across the country will be doing that. Sarah and Steve, this point that Rob raises about access to law, uh, access to justice and getting legal uh, representation, how important is that, Sarah? It's really important and it's it's really good to hear Rob speak. I, I work for Shelter for, for many years and, and, and they do absolutely incredible work giving um, legal advice. Legal advice is uh, cutting legal advice and legal aid is, is a false economy because the cost uh, ends up being greater because people end up being homeless. So you need to make sure you've got organisations like Shelter, like, like Citizens Advice, being able to give advice to people at that early stage where they're at risk of homelessness, and you need the legal aid further down the line so that they can defend themselves in court. But look, I think the, the issue with COVID is it's, it's, it's shined a light on a problem that was already there. The million households that are waiting uh, on the council waiting list. I mean, it's, it's quite hard to get on those lists. There's many more who are in overcrowded and unsuitable accommodation. And at the heart of this is a decade of cuts to support services for sure, mental health services, addiction services for sure, but also social housing building. We are hemorrhaging council homes because of um, they're being sold off faster than they're being built. And that uh, needs to be fixed by this government. They have to prioritise building right. social homes. So we have somewhere to put the people who are facing a crisis now. And as we go into winter, just quickly, as we go into yeah. winter, the winter uh, fund this year is less than it was last year. The government has to stick by its promise to keep people off the streets because it's going to be a very cold and difficult period for a lot of people. The, the, the Everyone In programme has been successful, Claire. Um, I mean, they did literally get everyone off the streets. Um, and so it shows that when the will is there, it, it, it is possible to do. This was rough sleeping rather than the broader uh, issue of homelessness. So I, yes. my, the first ever full-time job I had was working in a homelessness shelter for a couple of years in, in Coventry. So homelessness and getting people off the streets, brilliant to see that happen. And yes, short term. But look, it's, it's, it's just going to be so much worse. I mean, we've talked about evictions and renters. Rob's made some 
very strong points. But it's not COVID that's done this. It's also the reactions to COVID. It's the consequences of perpetual lockdown. I mean, we've got mm. to balance risks. It's not just renters. I mean, what about the hairdressers who bought their house? I mean, there's going to be people mortgage defaulting. There's going to yeah. be... A massive problem. So on the one hand, I want us to go deeper. We need to build more houses. I hardly need to say. And they don't have to be, you know, zero uh, you know, eco houses. I just want more houses all the time. But it's not just that. It's what we're doing is we're forcing people who actually were making a living by closing down the hospitality trade, by closing down all these industries, mm. I think far too much and not balancing the risk. We are just going to destroy people's capacity to have a home to live in. Right. Well, Rob, do you agree with that? Lock down has actually made it even more difficult. Uh, I think it's made it enormously difficult, especially for people who are self-employed, but I don't want to get drawn into that. Safe to say that what's refreshing is that fundamentally what I hear across the panel is that there is universal agreement that this is an issue that has to be and must be resolved, and it's the barometer by which we as a nation are assessed. As for access to justice, I have to repeat myself, legal aid has died and disappeared. That means if you earn roughly around £16,000, you're not entitled to um, legal advice. It was described before as a false economy. That's one way of describing it. I would describe it as an absolute disgrace. Uh, you can't consider our rule of law to be worth anything. And certainly, as we think about how that threads itself into the tapestry of our democracy, unless everybody has access to justice, it's meaningless. Right. Rob, thank you very much. I'm just going to get a response from you, though, Ed, on both those things. You were nodding as Claire was talking about lockdown, actually making uh, this more difficult, and then perhaps respond on the access to justice. Well, look, uh, lockdown sceptic is a, is a pejorative term, but I, I consider myself a lockdown sceptic. I think the the, the failure to balance the risk of the coronavirus against the catastrophic effect on our economy and people's livelihoods has been absolutely terrible. I think Rob is right about access to justice. I did pro bono work when I was uh, a trainee barrister. And, uh, you know, we have cut legal aid very, very deeply. And I think it is very, very short-sighted to do that because access to justice uh, actually saves the state money in the long run because you get cases dealt with much more... Uh, efficiently and people get proper legal advice. But I, I, I would say, you know, the government is doing a lot in terms of homelessness. Everyone in has been a success. Uh, housing policy in terms of wraparound care for people with mental health issues, for example, coming off the streets and going to housing. Sure. And there are lots of Conservatives, people like Brooks Newmark, yeah. Adam Holloway, <laughs> campaigning on these issues. It could be and should be cross-party there are solutions out there. There does need to be leadership right. and there probably does need to be money. All right, but if you look at the figures, we haven't got time to show the graph. You can see the homelessness figures have gone up oh, yeah, uh, consistently yeah. since 2010 when the Tories uh, came into power in the coalition. Rob Rinder, thank you very much uh, for joining us for that discussion um, on homelessness and rough sleeping. We're going to move on to the Labour Party um, and the news that Jeremy Corbyn um, has not been readmitted, as was announced yesterday as a Labour MP, despite being allowed back into the party as a member. It's triggered this response from the General Secretary uh, of Unite Union, Len McCluskey. It looks to me very much like a witch hunt and persecution of, um, of a decent man. You know, people can disagree with Corbyn on a whole host of things, but I think most people regard him as a decent, honest individual. And to be persecuted and witch hunted in this way is, is, is not the Labour Party way of doing things. Steve, is it a witch hunt? It's not a, a witch hunt, but I think it's a series of calculations by the Labour leadership which are deeply misjudged. And it's the first example, I think, of Keir Starmer making a very big strategic error. I mean by that the first decision to suspend Jeremy Corbyn uh, from the Labour Party. Because I remember going on Newsnight that night and saying, so what happens next? Lots of people that evening hailing strong leadership. But then what happens if Jeremy Corbyn is reinstated, as he half was earlier this week? Yeah. And, then, and so on. And so you have a position where uh, there is now a degree of chaos, a perception of division, all of which was wholly avoidable. Keir Starmer made clear emphatically on the day of the original uh, human rights report that he totally disagreed with Jeremy Corbyn, was moving on from that and implementing this report as he had to. And instead, he's moved Jeremy Corbyn centre stage and created a narrative around his fate 
which is very difficult for him to manage, and it was wholly avoidable. Sarah? Well, I disagree. I mean, three weeks ago, the EHRC report was published and it showed failings in the Labour Party in terms of leadership, in terms of process, in, in terms of culture. And the response from Kia was absolutely clear. We have to accept all the findings and we have to reach out to the Jewish community um, and build bridges. And it was a day for, for voices from our Jewish community talking about the pain that they had felt. And um, at that point, it wasn't the time for questioning the findings. It wasn't the time for questioning the scale of the problem in the party. And so Kia has made the decision that he has, and, and I support him in that. What's really important, and I, I agree with Steve, is that we have to, we have to put um, our relationships with the Jewish community front and centre stage and hear them. And we have uh, six weeks to work with the EHRC on an action plan, uh, which I think takes us to about mid-December. And in that plan, there will be an independent process because we've seen that this process doesn't work. We need an independent process that can make sure uh, things are done fair and well, and we need to change our culture and change our processes, change the way All right. we engage with our, with our Jewish um, colleagues and, and the Jewish community. Steve? You see, I think the whole focus and the whole media focus would be on exactly that if Keir Starmer had not done, I know it was the general secretary, but he, he could have stopped it, if the suspension hadn't taken place. You can argue about the substance of the whether he deserved to be and so on. And that too, I think, is contentious. But Jeremy Corbyn had become a relatively marginal figure. He was back doing what he likes. He was in his constituency being a backbench MP. And what Keir Starmer has done has moved him absolutely back to the centre of the stage. So most voters who don't follow the ins and outs will notice one thing, that Labour are split again. If that hadn't happened, I think now the focus would be solely on, OK, how is Keir Starmer going to respond to that report? Um, how quickly is he going to do it? And so on. But instead, it's become partly a soap opera, partly something very, very difficult for him to manage and um, will torment his leadership in the coming weeks when he should have the space to be focusing on a government facing mountainous challenges, which I don't think many would claim they're meeting. Sarah? Well, I, I don't. I just simply don't agree. Um, when you're faced with a situation, you need to respond. And Keir took the view that the right, the right way to stick by his commitment to the Jewish community was to act in the way that he has. Now we do need to focus on implementing the um, mm. uh, recommendations from the report. That's absolutely right. When I talk to uh, the Jewish community, um, I uh, have talked recently about issues around, for example hate crime online, the horrible um, abuse online that Jewish people get during COVID, uh, that, that Jewish people started COVID, that there's some really horrible hate crime that we need to focus on and tackle. And we need to make sure we get that done so that we can all move on. And, and on that, I, I totally agree with Steve. How do you view it, Claire? Do you think Steve's right that actually uh, the situation, if you're looking at it from the outside, it is a mess? <clears throat> The thing that is most distressing about this is that we are now discussing the processes of the Labour Party, internal processes. The discussion is about how to save the reputation of the Labour Party. You know, is this the best way for Keir Starmer to look like he's tackling the anti... What we're not discussing is anti-Semitism. You know, the key issue he for didn't me... Want, he didn't want to do that, of course. He wanted to end no, all the discussions know, of the Labour Party. But I actually stage. don't think you can... I don't think you can just declare we are not going to have anti any, any anti-Semitism. The truth is, I've been banging on about the rise of um, anti-Semitism on the left for years, and everybody in the Labour Party, you know, it's like, it's a marginal issue, it's not important. But that kind of crass anti-capitalism that we know kind of takes the form of racial stereotypes, the obsession with Israel as the prior state. And all I'm saying is, the problem here is that we're having a technocratic discussion about what should be a campaign to argue about why anti-Semitism, what anti-Semitism is, how you fight it and so on. What? Not just, I mean, all I'm saying is, is that the discussion now is, is this the best way for Keir Starmer to distance himself from that period, even well, though he campaigned for, for Corbyn? Well, Steve, what and do you... I th just think it's just, what, it's, 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 it's depressing. Well, Steve, what do you think? Well, I, I completely agree with Claire. I'm, I'm giving an analysis to what has happened yeah. in recent weeks, which has led to a focus on 
process uh, the, uh, 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 the fueling of a division. It's making Labour, I think, seem more divided than it really is. Um, but that's not me. I mean, I'm just responding to what happened. I think if um, he, uh, uh, Keir Starmer had stuck to his original plan on the day the report was published and established absolute difference uh, between him and Jeremy Corbyn and then focused on the scale of anti-Semitism and what can be done about it within the Labour Party, his direct responsibility, that's what we would be talking about. Right. Um, but his move as a leader, and leadership is partly artistry, uh, has led us to be talking about other things. Well, uh, what might also torment him, to use uh, your word, uh, Steve, is this uh, piece in The Guardian by Jessica Elgott. She's also tweeted, multiple sources say conversations took place in recent weeks between representatives of Corbyn and key figures in Starmer's office, including his chief of staff, Morgan McSweeney. Um, Sarah? Well, I have literally no idea what conversations go on. I know that publicly there have been many people who have, have um, defended Jeremy, um, like um, Len McCluskey, and I, uh, I am sure that those trade unions will be having conversations with, with people about their views. They're having those conversations publicly and, and on the media. But the whole point about the process is to make sure there isn't political uh, involvement from the leadership and the deputy leadership, right. and that's what we're going to put in place. And, and to, to Claire's point, I was trying trying to raise the issue of the effect that COVID and some of the abuse that, that Jewish people have suffered during that period has had. That is absolutely what yeah. my focus is as a shadow policing minister. That is what our focus absolutely. is, trying to make sure we can build those relationships and move on and tackle the problem. That, that was that, face. But was there a deal done between Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn to readmit him into the party that the leader then reneged on? No. Um, were there conversations between Len McCluskey, who was speaking publicly, and between uh, people in his organisation and, uh, and, 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 and others? I, I imagine there were. But was there a deal? No, of course there wasn't. And of course, the leadership weren't party to that, because oh. that is what the report identified as being inappropriate. OK, Steve, um, is that right? Is that your understanding? Can Sarah be so sure? Uh, well, my understanding is partly based on this. On the Sunday after uh, Corbyn was suspended, Keir Starmer went on to the Mar show and said, and incidentally, this is one example of how his space was suddenly narrowed. He was on to talk about the lockdown, but half of it was about Jeremy Corbyn, the interview rightly. Um, and Keir Starmer said what we would like to see from him is some words to uh, amend what he said on the day. So from that, we can assume very clearly that there were some mediating agencies trying to get words. Words were delivered this week. But then some Labour MPs said to Keir Starr, we've heard from Margaret Hodge, that they were nowhere near good enough. And he obviously was in this bind then. And I understand the bind, because apparently Margaret Hodge was going to resign, others might go. And what do you do? But it was a bind created by that original strategic naivety. And, um, and now he, he, he's in this position where it's very hard to see how it is resolved. Yes. To go back to Claire's point, until there's resolution... A lot of us, you know, the, uh, there will be a lot of folks on this rather than the issue, which, of course, is central. All right. Well, we were talking about this yesterday on the programme and the Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister, um, Andrew Mitchell, had this to respond for the Tory party, which was about racism in the Tory party. Let me be very, very clear that whether it's uh, anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, the Conservative Party has zero tolerance of that. There are structures, strong oh. structures within the Conservative Party, well. within Conservative Central Office, which tackle it immediately. Zero tolerance uh, within the Conservative Party, Ed Vasey, of any sort of racism. Is that right? Well, there certainly should be. I mean, this is another surreal uh, moment for me and a good example of why I'm a rubbish politician, because I've got an enormous respect for Steve Richards as a political commentator. He's one of my total favourites. But I was oh. very surprised, because I thought, as somebody who's no longer really involved in politics, that Keir Starmer has come out of this very, very well. I think mm. most right But we're talking about the Conservative Party. Uh, just well, you yeah. refused to come to me, because I'm such a rubbish politician, while Claire and... That wasn't the reason, Sarah actually. And but, yeah. Steve were giving their views, and I was dying to say that. Actually, I quite well, support Keir Starmer on this, because I think most decent yeah. Labour voters... But we're going to talk to you about the Conservative Party, because you're a Conservative beer. I, I'll talk about that in a minute, because most Conservative... Uh, most decent Labour voters would love to see um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn kicked out of the Labour Party. I've no idea why he was a Labour MP 
in the first place. He, he completely destroyed right. the Labour and Party. And on the question of zero him, tolerance from... of racism in the Conservative Party, is that true? Well, there should be zero right. tolerance. Right, but you don't know if it's actually true. And perhaps the reason you don't know, and perhaps Andrew Mitchell was misguided in stating it so categorically, is that actually there's no open and transparent system uh, for suspending members subject to investigations. The party doesn't publish any figures. So they don't know, and you couldn't know. Well, if that's the case, they should change it. I mean, I'm totally up for having o open and transparent systems for dealing with racist members of the Conservative Party and for making sure that we are... Uh, an open and inclusive uh, Conservative Party. I mean, I'm not going to go into the sort of, you know, what you would expect from the p politicians' riff about uh, how many people we have from uh, different ethnic minority communities who are uh, both MPs and prominent members of our party. Of course there are, and I think, you know, the fact we... I think that we often demonstrate that those people uh, have very prominent roles in the Conservative Party, but no political party mm. should Can you make that claim? <laughs> Uh, have, having a, uh, where you don't have a proper system of dealing with this kind of uh, all right. Well, where, where I, this kind of problem manifests. Well, that's so dealing with it promptly. That okay. Well, that statement from Andrew Mitchell yesterday also caused something of a Twitter uh, row uh, between the Tory MP Michael Fabricant and Mick Dadversi from the Muslim Council of Britain, who said it isn't true. Um, and after a while, Michael Fabricant tweeted this: "Your spite and unpleasantness neither does the cause of tolerance in this country nor the cause of Anglo-Muslim relations." any good at all. What was he talking about? <laughs> I have no idea what he was talking about. All, all I'm saying is that any organisation, whether it's a political party, a company or a charity, should have processes in place that deal with any employee or member who uh, is racist or behaves in a racist manner yeah. and they should be dealt with promptly. What, 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 what? And what does the phrase Anglo-Muslim... Well, I'm not here. I'm not Michael Fabricant. No, well, I'm just I mean, telling but you it's not I'm acceptable. Saying. Right, Claire. It's not acceptable. Well, right. should, yeah, but should he be reprimanded for using but, that sort of... But the only, the only thing is, I, I mean, I, I hope we get to have a conversation about free speech. Because We're about, about to. Because what, what my fear is, I mean, Anglo-Muslim relations is a nonsense phrase, as we yeah. know, because obviously there's loads of... Um, um, English, British, UK Muslims, it's a mad phrase. And we, but, but this kind of gotcha on the misspeaking doesn't help anybody either. That's I'm not you, no, no I, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. I'm saying I do think that what I want is to be able to fight racism, argue about why there are racist ideas in society without it being just linguistic and language. Ah, That's my Well, concern. you've led us then very neatly into a discussion on hate crime. Uh, we're going to talk to Professor uh, Penny Lewis from the Law Commission for England and Wales. And this is about the Law Commission uh, publishing proposals to toughen up and broaden the scope of the laws relating to hate crime. Um, Penny, what are you proposing exactly? So the way that hate crime law works is to make more serious existing criminal offences. So, for example, uh, assault or criminal damage or harassment. And what we're proposing is the way that it should do that should treat all uh, protected characteristics like race or religion or sexual orientation equally. At the moment, it doesn't do that. It treats them inconsistently. So that's one major strand of our proposals. We've also been looking at whether any additional protected characteristics should be added. And we provisionally proposed that sex or gender should be added so that uh, crimes that uh, involve hostility towards women, uh, which uh, are prevalent yeah. uh, should be recognised as hate crimes and therefore treated as more serious crimes. All right. And you want to make it easier for people to be prosecuted for comments they make in their own homes. Why? Um, no, I, I, I don't think that's quite right. OK. We, um, we, th that, that argument refers to a very small number of quite serious offences uh -huh. uh, involving the stirring up of hatred on the grounds of race, religion, or sexual orientation. Those offences, which, uh, as I mentioned, they're quite serious. Hatred is quite a high threshold. Those offences have a dwelling exemption, so that uh, if someone stirs up hatred, for example, against a racial minority in a home, the, that doesn't fall within the offence. Okay. We're concerned that that's poorly targeted, so that, for instance, a political meeting in a large home wouldn't be covered 
but a conversation in a in a car between two people would be covered. We think that's um, a problem, and we're we're looking at how best right. to deal with those kinds of conversations. Claire, I was so shocked when I read the proposals. I'm glad there's a consultation, and I hope everybody says what they think about this. Which is, this is a recipe for a terrifyingly draconian form of censorship. We already have that informally. I do not think it is going to benefit or do anything positive whatsoever. Hatred in and of itself is overly subjective. Expanding the definition and hardening it is going to make it worse. It actually makes things very confusing in the eyes of the law. A crime should be the crime. You know, if you are raped or stabbed oh. or whatever, adding this in actually is politicising it. And just just finally, mm -hmm. I do think, you know, in the in the report, it actually talks about things like the infamous cartoons, Islamophobic cartoons. I mean, at a time when I think part of the UK's global image should be to back up President Macron absolutely in his call for enlightenment values and in view of what's happened in France, this seems to me to be effectively saying that that because cartoons and images will now also be put into the same space as speech. Sarah, this is a recipe for bans and censorship, and it's frightening. Sarah, do you agree they should be tightened up, or do you? Well, listen, I, I worked with the Law Commission um, a lot when I was Shadow Housing Minister. They were looking at very complex uh, leasehold law, and they are incredibly thorough, and they will be looking at unintended consequences. They will be looking in all this detail, and there is a consultation process. But what we must not lose sight of is that hate crime is on the rise. It's up 9% um, uh, this year, and only uh, less than 10% of crimes ever get to the point of charges being made. These are real people who are suffering and we need an overall approach to what we're going to do about that. So whether it's the online harms bill, whether it's how uh, we tackle um, the definition of the law as the Law Commission is looking at, there is a whole raft of things we need to do to make sure those vulnerable people who are getting abused um, can see justice. Ed, do you think it will limit free speech or do you think it's necessary? I... I about to no one in my support freedom of expression and obviously as Minister for the Arts which I was for six years it was a very very important part of uh, what the arts do but I think Professor Lewis explained uh, what the Law Commission is doing very very clearly and I think one can easily caricature it as nonsense and uh, censorship and restriction it's not we've we've had for many many years uh, an understanding that there are aggravating factors in existing criminal offences, that if you assault somebody because of their colour of their skin, that is an aggravating factor in the assault, and that, that often translates through to the sentence you might rece receive. There are only actually two specific uh, crimes, of, uh, as it were, which is the incitement of racial hatred... Stirring ..and up, also yeah. um, chance on the racist chance on the football terraces. And if the Law Commission is simply looking at providing... Oh. Uh, at ..getting rid of anomalies and making the law clearer, that is something I would support. But I would say it is a review and we'll see what they come out with. But I don't... Claire, I think to are you, over, are somehow, you overreacting here? You know, well, I, don't, I really don't think I am. I think I'm understating it. We've seen the, the proposed legislation in Scotland. It's very similar. This is England and, and Wales. No, yeah. I, I've said yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, no, that's what I mean, just yes. to remind people. And people have said it's almost like a blasphemy law. There's all sorts of problems with it. But even that kind of uh, broadening out the additional uh, characteristics. But I, I thought the explanation of the dwelling exemption was classic, you know, which is, oh, no, we're not really going to say that it's in your homes, but if you happen to be having a meeting in your home, that's in your homes. That means that right. in the privacy of for your all, home... All, what, and well, also, Professor Lewis stirring, said, is, is you what could, is you, stirring up hatred? It could this potentially what... be an offence if you're in your car, but yes. not in your home. Yes. So she's simply saying yeah. that... There needs to so be I'd a, get rid of the car rules. rule okay, rather well, that, than the, the house rule. All I'm saying is we have a, a consultation, so you can yeah, come back. I will do. <laughs> and, and the Free Speech Union will, and hopefully Index on Censorship will, and all the rest of it. What I'm saying is, you know, we, we're actually at the moment in a situation where actually the Labour Party were calling for a ban on and censorship of misinformation around coronavirus. Anti-vaxxers have... being demonised as hate figures. And on that... I worry about the fact that there's a broader problem Claire, of censorship. We're at the end of the programme. Thank you to all of my guests today. That's all we have time for. Back on Monday. In the beginning, I felt... 